Hello and welcome to the Tennis Podcast. My name is Nick. I'm Brandon. Brandon, how are you doing? I'm doing so good. Would you take the Battle of Winterfell or Avengers Endgame? Uh, funny you should ask. I watched them both on the same day. And we should note that as we're as we're recording this, the most recent episode of Game of Thrones was the Battle of Winterfell. Um, I loved Endgame and gave me all kinds of fun times and feelings all over the place, but I had a much stronger reaction, both being scared and tense and surprised and delighted with the Game of Thrones episode. It's weird that 21 movies leading up to this three-hour epic, which was great and not to diminish Endgame, but even at the end of the movie with the most poignant parts, uh, still didn't give me all the thrills and chills that the Battle of Winterfell did, especially the, uh, the end. I know it's a controversial thing about who defeated the Night King, but I love it. I love the episode too, although I'm, I'm seeing a lot of backlash from fans on Reddit and the such to some plot holes in the episode, which aren't entirely uh, unfounded, but despite that, Still thought it was a really strong episode and just incredible. If you take a step back and just look at it, like take your entertained glasses off and just look at it from a practical standpoint of filming that. It's amazing. It's really incredible. Yeah, I can't imagine it. You you know, my favorite part of the episode actually was the first 10 minutes before the fighting even started. Just the mood setting and stage setting. I watched it. Uh, I watched it alone in the dark with. Um, are you talking? Wait, are you talking about Killer Clowns from Space? The- or <laughs> I watched it. This I watched it the same way. I watched it uh, in the dark on the big TV, but with my earbuds plugged in through the Xbox. So I'm not waking up the family, but I'm just in a deep dark black box, <laughs> and it's just me. <laughs> it's just me and the army of the dead. And as for Endgame, haven't seen it, don't really plan to. I'm way behind on the Marvel Universe. Um, But it's uh, on track to become the highest grossing film of all time, surpassing Avatar. Yeah. And it's only been out like, what, a week and a half at this point? Or maybe just a week? I don't know, but pretty incredible. Maybe we'll talk about Endgame another time. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. Why don't we get down to business here? This is the show where we talk about top 10 lists. One of us brings a list, the other guesses it. And this week, Brandon has the list. Brandon, is this a good list or a bad list? Well, I guess what's your definition of a good list? A list that you will enjoy? It's a bad list, isn't it? It's a list that is very timely given our conversation about uh, Avengers Endgame. Today, we're talking about the 10 most popular comic book characters. Based on what? Based on, uh, this is probably, I I think, one of the most scientific ways that you could measure this. It's by the number of appearances in comic book issues. So, the numbers you'll hear today are numbers of comic book issues that this character has appeared in. And I think the market would dictate how much they want to see a particular character in a comic book. And you should also consider... Comic book characters often show up in comics that aren't their own. Like Wolverine is not just in X-Men comics. He's also in Wolverine comics. He's also in Hulk comics. He's in Spider-Man comics, Archie comics, uh, Casper the Ghost comics. Family Circus. These issue appearances can also count their appearances across other brands. So, to be clear though, we're talking specifically about comics, not movies, not TV shows. The number of appearances in comic book issues. Can that appearance be like the equivalent of a cameo where they're just like in a very brief part? I'm sure it does. I'm sure it could count as that. And I don't know how often that happens in comic books. Not very often. With all of the characters listed in here, it's almost unthinkable that they would appear in a story and not have at least a line of dialogue. Okay. Although you are not a comic book fan or a comic book reader... I can say with a high degree of confidence, you have heard of every character in the top 10. Yeah, so let me give some background to our thumb twaddlers out there. I don't read comics. Um, I think they're fine. I think if you like them, that's fine. It's very gracious of you. I used to watch all the superhero movies. I just gave up around two or three years ago. I think the last superhero film I saw was uh, the first Ant-Man. But uh, anyway, so I say that to say I have a pretty decent working knowledge of superheroes, but I've not read any comics. So, you'll, you'll be learning today as well. I'll be learning today. What was your source, by the way? Should have said that at the top. Uh, these are sourced from Ranker.com. Ranker.com, okay. Uh, this was not user submitted though. This was done by Ranker staff. 
Okay, well, you got the top 10, right? Actually, I have the top 10 and then I also have, I actually have all the way through top 25. Do you want to rule out which comic characters certainly not be in the top 10? Yeah, I'll do that. I'm going to say that Jughead. This is any comic character. It's not just superheroes. It's all superheroes. Okay. It's all superheroes. There's no one who's not. So, there's no baby from Baby Blues on there? <laughs> no. Uh, and I'm... No Dilbert? Well, those are comic strips. Oh, give me a fucking break. A comic book, you would have to include Archie, Casper, and I think they used to make a ton of like Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and Popeye comics back in the day. Is um, Casper, was he before the movie? Are you serious? I don't... Yeah. Uh, well... Yeah, yeah well, it was a comic book yeah. and then it was a cartoon, a cartoon for a long time and then yeah, the, the movie is based on the comic and cartoon. I think I've heard this question posed before, but is Casper, was Casper, like are ghosts born, did he have ghost parents and he was born as a ghost baby and now he's a child ghost? No, his ass died as a human baby. He died as a human child. He's the ghost of a child that died. Isn't that a safe assumption? I guess. That's creepy too though. They're both creepy. It, well, those are his brothers too, right? The older mean ones. Oh, I forgot about them. So, they're all dead ski. Don't they all have big, round, dumpy ghost butts? <laughs> <laughs> well, one is gargantuan. Is the other one thin and creepy? Yeah, and I think there's a third one that might be in the middle. I don't know, but... Um, <laughs> the third one's the doy doy. Yeah, but I, my working knowledge from Casper comes exclusively from the movie with... What's her name? Uh, Christina... Christina Ricci. So, no, there's, there's no Archie. There's no Jughead. You're just admitting at the top that all the top 10 are superheroes. All the top 25 are superheroes. Okay. And we're talking individual characters, so I couldn't just say like the X-Men. That's right. Okay. So, I'm going to guess not in the top 10, mm -hmm. Aquaman. You're right. Aquaman is, Aquaman is actually not in the top 25. Yeah, because if I recall, he's kind of, he's actually not that huge from comics, right? Uh, no. In fact, uh, Aquaman is uh, DC and then Marvel has a Atlantean underwater guy named Namor. And neither one of them are in the top 25. I think people are really bored by, like, if you're under the sea and you're not a mermaid, people don't understand what you're doing down there. Is it pretty universally agreed that the DC films have been much weaker than... Yeah, there's things that I like about the, like, Batman versus Superman movie. There's definitely stuff that I like about it, but overall, they just, they don't have that sense of, like, fun and... That sense of fun that I that the Marvel movies have. That sense of fun. They don't. It's very dark. Like everyone is moody yeah, and the, it, even the, the color palette is dark and everything is so serious and emotional and moody. It's like our podcast, Dark, Serious, Moody. As opposed to Endgame that had some very like deep poignant parts but it also had some really funny parts. It had some parts that were clearly fan service but they were done really well. I mean, they should take every cue from them. Like, even if people said you're just ripping off what Marvel has done, they should still do it because it works and people enjoy it. But I would argue that because the Dark Knight trilogy uh, was totally dark and not like Marvel and it was the most successful DC character films ever. I mean, they were really grounded in reality, which I think makes them a little bit more palatable for people who aren't into superheroes. I, I would disagree with that too. I think the Marvel formula makes it more palatable for people that aren't into superheroes. Which m formula is that? What you were just saying, the fun, kind of lighthearted at times, colorful. No, you, you are right about that. Well, we're not going to solve. We're not going to solve comics and movies today. Let me give you some guesses on more that aren't in the top. I'll just say top 25 even. Okay. Are you trying to think of some uh, obscure superheroes? Yeah, I'm trying to think of someone kind of at the Aquaman level. Someone who's, a, who's basically a, like a boob in a suit. How about the Suicide Squad characters, not counting the Joker? Like all of those... Like Harley Quinn. How about Harley Quinn? No, not at all. In fact... I bet Ant-Man's not in there either. Ant-Man is not in there. Because I kind of got the sense that for some of those, some of those like movies that have come out recently, Ant-Man and Suicide Squad that they're kind of reaching because all the main, main, like mainstream yeah. superheroes have already been done. Actually, let me look at this, at this uh, top 10 and I'll let you know if there's any one of these. So, everyone so far that I've seen has starred 
in their own movie or been one of the main characters in a movie. How about Hawkeye? No, Hawkeye and Black Widow are not in the top 25. Am I not killing this fucking list already? You know, you're you're doing better than I thought. You see, you think I'm a doy doy about this and this in the Star Wars, I'm, I mean, I think I'm, I think I have like a, a gift. There's no, <laughs> you're touched, touched by, yeah, you've been touched by an angel. There's, uh, there's no Guardians of the Galaxy in the top 25. No Hellboy. No, no Hellboy. There are no, uh, there are no independent comic book characters. So, they're all DC or Marvel. They're all DC or Marvel and if you follow or you are interested in the whatever relationship or differences, uh, competition between DC and Marvel, this list might shake out kind of interesting to you. Captain Underpants. <laughs> Captain Underpants didn't make it either. I used to have an Animaniacs comic book as a kid. Yeah, I used to get uh, Simpsons comic books. Why am I not surprised? How about... Okay, so... I'm going to guess the top 10 in reverse order. Okay. And I'm going to nail it. I'd be surprised, but I'm, hey, I'm on your, I'm on your team though. I'm rooting for you. Well, then we're fucked. How about this? I'm not going to guess like specifically number 10, but I'm going to guess the bottom half of the top 10. Okay. Incredible Hulk. Incredible Hulk is number 13 on the list. <clears throat> you know, I was close. You're, yeah, you're on the right track. I'm going to guess Catwoman is in the top 25, but not the top 10. Catwoman is not in the top 25. Catwoman is uh, only one from many in Batman's rogues gallery. And although they have at times had a sensual relationship, <laughs> she still did not crack the top 25, which uh, is actually really interesting when you see who some of the characters in the top 25 are. How about Robin? Is he, He's between 10 and 25 or 11 and 25. I'm going to, I'm going to give you... Uh, the an you, you answered Robin. Uh, on the list, uh, the character Dick Grayson is listed. And you may not know that there have been several Robins. Several characters take up the mantle of Robin in the comics. But Dick Grayson was the original Robin uh, who then became Nightwing. Dick Grayson is number 14 on the list. Did you hear that? While you were talking, I could hear a huge rush as all the non-superhero fans <laughs> unsubscribed clicked stop on this podcast because they were going to sample it and then as soon as you started getting into the history of Dick Grayson, they're like, I'm out. Well, that was it. I kept it very short but Dick Grayson is number 14 and he is the only character, he's the only Robin on the list. What color do you think his winky is? I'm The smart money's on gray, right? I'm glad you brought up about Winkies, <laughs> because that is in my notes for some of these characters. Now, Ra uh, Dick Grayson is a human. Okay. He's not a mutant, nor is he a human mutate. Uh, he has no superpowers, so I believe his winky probably just looks normal. Can you describe a normal looking winky for us? And don't use your own, because odds are it's not normal. Like a big thumb without a nail. <laughs> All right, moving on. I'm still aiming for the bottom half of the top 10 here. Okay. Aim for that bottom. Iron Man. Iron Man. Iron Man is... 10 or 11, I'm guessing. Number 7. God damn it! Uh, Iron Man is number 7 on the list with 8,697 issue appearances. God damn. It's, it's actually crazy how much comics there are. And can we talk about how comics are like in this resurgence right now? They've been in a state of resurgence for, I don't know, probably about 10 years or so. Yeah. I, I would say since the first, if memory serves, the first like mainstream modern superhero film was Spider-Man with Tobey Maguire. Does that sound right? Yeah. I mean, I know there were the Batmans in like the 80s and the 90s, but. Yeah, you're right. Spider-Man in the early 2000s, I think 2000 or 2001 is when the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man came out and yeah, it kind of kicked that off. Uh, I think it picked up like a lot of steam with Batman Begins. I think that was 2006, five or 2007, 2005. But then it was, it was shortly after that, that DC Comics did a relaunch. Uh, they relaunched and they called it the New 52. Yeah. Are you familiar with that, Matt? I've heard about that, yeah. The New 52 was a new comic every week for an entire year. That's the New 52. 
I think all that stuff's still going strong. Uh, the graphic novel section at the bookstore continues to grow every time I go over there. Right, and I right. think graphic graphic novels are a good way for someone who doesn't want to go and shell out a lot of money for comics and try to collect them or keep them nice. You can just go pick up a collection or a volume or a graphic novel and enjoy that way. A graphic novel can like capture a, a whole series of comics. Yeah. If DC is really good about putting together graphic novels that have a beginning, middle and end and you can pick those up uh, with almost any DC character. Uh, Marvel is better about putting together volumes uh, that contain like a storyline as comics were originally published. What would you say today is the average price of a newly released comic, like standalone comic? I think it's like three ninety five. Uh, do you know what the most expensive comic is today? I'm not sure, but I, I believe it's still Action Comics number one, the first appearance of Superman. If I remember right, Nicolas Cage has a very nice copy of it worth quite a bit of money. I just looked it up. An original copy of the Action Comics number one that initially cost 10 cents and introduced Earth to Superman became the world's most expensive comic book when it ranked 3.2 million on eBay. <laughs> yeah. It's insane. Let me give you some facts about Iron Man. Okay. Uh, Iron Man is a Marvel comic character. His first appearance was in Tales of Suspense number 39 in 1963. Iron Man's true identity is Tony Stark. Now, a few facts. What are, what are Tony Stark or Iron Man's abilities? And as I read these abilities, you'll start to find a re some recurring themes across these superheroes. Genius level intellect, proficient scientist and engineer. That's all of them. And then, of course, he has his power armor suit, which grants him superhuman strength and durability, supersonic flight. It's equipped with energy repulsors and missile projection, and also supports him with regenerative life support. Regenerative? What is that last one? Regenerative life support. So like if he dies, he comes back? So, if he got hurt, there's stuff inside that might, you know, help him heal. Like, well, you, did you see Infinity War? No. Well, in Infinity War, uh, he has advanced his technology so that it is now nanotechnology and he can build his metal suit. It just sort of creeps over his skin and makes the suit. Uh, and part of the, that new suit is like it can shoot like a frost, like a freezing type thing, you know? Yeah. And he used that frost to um, seal a, a puncture in his suit where he had been injured. You know who'd be a good superhero? Jack Frost, the snowman. <laughs> Do you remember when Michael Keaton played Jack Frost? Yeah, I mean, I also remember when Michael Keaton played an actual superhero Batman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Jack Frost could shoot ice shit at people. Carrots? <laughs> he could shoot one carrot. He could throw a carrot. And then once, once he gets through the carrot, he starts throwing coals and then sticks and then his hat. <laughs> So, yeah, he just, and, but so he's only got a few shots in him before he's out of ammo. <laughs> he doesn't have, actually, he doesn't have any superpowers that like a, a just a regular person <laughs> who's willing to throw their clothing doesn't have. <laughs> but maybe he could have more precise throwing and then maybe he could fly on a wind of like snowstorm. But, you know, did you remember Jack Frost was a horror film as well? Remember that? No. There was Jack Frost, the scary killer snowman. Michael Keaton should have been in that one. Yeah. Michael Keaton should be in everything. Well... So, wait, you mentioned Iron Man was in Tales of Suspense or something like that. Yeah. Well, my question is, do most of these characters debut in like a side story sort of deal where they're not the main feature of a comic? A lot of them do, yes. Iron Man was created by Stan Lee. Keep in mind, he was created in 1963 as public opinion, public support... Uh, Vietnam was starting to have, people were starting to, to think, maybe think differently about the Vietnam War. Interesting quote on the uh, origin of Iron Man from Stan Lee. Uh, and it reveals that he was created by Stan Lee to spite hippies. How so? Well, Stan Lee said, I think I gave myself a dare. It was the height of the Cold War. The readers, the young readers, if there was one thing they hated, it was war. It was the military. So, I got a hero who represented that to the hundredth degree. He was a weapons manufacturer. He was providing weapons for the army. He was rich. He was an industrialist. I thought it would be fun to take the kind of character that nobody would like, none of our readers would like, and shove him down their throats and make him like him. And he became very popular. 
<laughs> quote Stan Lee. So, yeah. Iron Man was created to shove down the throats of young anti-war activists. Yeah, and we have a lot of young anti-war activists listening to this show. What would be interesting if you, you probably don't have this, but how many comic appearances does Iron Man have before and after his first major movie? You know what I mean? I know what you mean and the vast majority are before. Iron Man appears in a ton of storylines across multiple series. The Infinity series, which all the most recent Marvel movies are based on of. I just feel like growing up as a kid, I didn't read comics but there were all these really popular comic cartoons like Spider-Man, Batman, Superman. I don't remember ever seeing Iron Man until... I don't remember hearing anyone ever talk about Iron Man until the first Robert Downey Jr. film came out. You're right. He was not too mainstream. Uh, he was even less mainstream than some that are ranked under him on this list. I think the difference is, uh, at least for a lot of us, Batman and Superman had cartoons. The Batman animated series uh, was packaged and usually broadcast right alongside new episodes of a, an animated Superman series. Then there were all the X-Men cartoons. I think that's specifically why the X-Men are so familiar. We're familiar with people before their movies was not because of the comics it was the specifically, was because of those 90s cartoons. Yeah, I remember that cartoon. That yeah. in turn got people, you know, also interested in the comics. But uh, yeah, Iron Man didn't stand out to me either really. I mean, I knew who he was. I read some of the comics. I knew like his general storyline. Can't see his ass through the suit either. What fun is that? Yeah. Okay, so number seven, Iron Got Man. Got number seven. Okay, so I'm going to guess that Wolverine is uh, also between five and ten. No, Wolverine is number three. That's some horse shit. <laughs> well, Wolverine... Are we sure this is legit? Yeah. Number of issue appearances, 12,912 issues. Something you have to remember about Wolverine is that he became immensely popular in the 90s, again... A lot of it thanks due to the popular cartoon. But he is a character that has appeared in, I mean, he's not just an X-Man. He's got his own comics outside of X-Men that just follow him. He's appeared with the Avengers. He's been in the Avengers. He's appeared in Spider-Man. He's a sometimes enemy, sometimes friend of Hulk. He's a character that a lot of writers like to have access to and work into their stories. And, and Marvel knows that Wolverine sells comics, so they'll stick Wolverine in wherever it makes sense and that's why he's number three on the list. He is a Marvel character. His first appearance, his first full appearance, his full, full issue appearance, his actual first appearance uh, is at the very end of Hulk number 180. The very first time you see Wolverine, he's, he's running out of the forest and he says, if you really want to tangle with someone, why not try your luck against the Wolverine. It sounds like what I said to my wife on our wedding night. It says, well, now you know what or who Weapon X is, faithful one. He's a living, raging powerhouse who's bound to knock you back on your emerald posterior. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, who has the emerald posterior? Hulk, I believe, because he's green. So, Wolverine was a, was a foe at that time. Yeah, he was running out of the woods to kick Hulk's ass in... 180 and then 181 is when the whooping began. What year is this? Uh, 1974. Uh, Wolverine's real name is James Howlett, but most people uh, know him by his other alias, Logan. His powers, his abilities are superhuman senses, agility, reflexes, and animal-like attributes. And, now, all and these you are... missed the biggest one, fucking huge claws coming out of his knuckles. Well, I haven't got there yet. I, well... I wanted to note that all... When I put these abilities together, I just copied and pasted directly from Wikipedia because some of the way, <laughs> some of the ways Wikipedia listed their abilities made me laugh and I wanted to leave them that way. Okay. Per Wikipedia, superhuman senses, agility, reflexes, and animal-like attributes, extended longevity via regenerative healing factor, adamantium infused skeleton adamantium is that fictional super strong metal retractable bone claws <laughs> and skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat and martial arts of course because of course naturally again uh, a common theme is skill in hand-to-hand -hand combat and martial arts i don't know if you know this in the comic books it's 
part of his character. In the movies, he was played by someone who's a little bit more like normal height. But in the comics, Wolverine is like about five feet tall. Why is that? It's just part of his... Because to be more like a Wolverine? To be more like a short, stocky Wolverine. He's uh, very short, thick, and grouchy. <laughs> grouchy. Wait, are you sure he's not a sidekick host in the comics? <laughs> I'm not short. You know Wolverine's haircut, right? I know Hugh Jackman's haircut. As Wolverine? Yeah. You agree that it looks stupid, right? I mean, yeah. His hair looks like his mask. It's got that weird pointy stuff on the side. Okay, yeah. What's your point? Everything about else about the character is really cool, except his flock of seagulls haircut. You mentioned really cool. What, what started this trend in superheroes always wearing like tights and... I'm glad you asked because in, in the rabbit holes I went down during research, I found out why superheroes were originally drawn wearing tights with their underwear on the outside. It's because in the 1920s, that's how, that was the depiction of like a strong man. You know, they used to be like, you would go to the circus to see the strong man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a guy with his hair parted almost in the middle uh, and he has a big curly mustache, but all he's wearing are trunks and he's buff. Those were the strong men at the time and to make kids immediately see that this superhero is a strong man, they drew them like strong men in that they were wearing basically onesies that showed off their muscles. Then why not just have the underwear only? Because that's what the strong men would wear. Well, I mean, that would look ridiculous. And by the way, uh, I'll save it for our Superman talk, but the cape is dumb. Like, it's only going to get in the way. Okay. <laughs> what else about Wolverine? Uh, that's all I had. Just that is, uh, I think he's a cool character, but his hair looks really stupid. Who would you rather fight, Wolverine or Iron Man in hand-to-hand -hand combat? Iron Man. But he's got the suit. You can't even punch him. That's fine. I don't expect to... I'm not expecting to land any punches. I'm trying to minimize pain and suffering. But you have no hope of even ending the fight because you no. can't hurt him. That's fine. I, I can't hurt either one of them. <laughs> then what's the plan at the end? I can't you... No, I get it. But you're fighting Iron Man. Yes. This has to end some way. Yes. It ends when he hits me with an energy <laughs> repulsor beam and I'm just either immediately <laughs> obliterated and dead or unconscious. I'd love to see you just obliterated <laughs> into a million pieces. Just running at Iron Man hoping that maybe he's distracted <laughs> for a minute. Uh, and he just stands there waiting for me to get close enough to blast. But see, with Wolverine, now I get all that. With Wolverine, I would immediately be eviscerated. <laughs> no, because you at least have the hope of like grabbing a pipe and bashing him on the head. It doesn't, but he <laughs> wouldn't slow him down. Wait a minute. He can take a pipe to the head like nothing? I mean. That's, you see, do you see why that's dumb? Because I can no. get why someone can have strong muscles, but there's no muscles in your head. Your head is just your head. Yeah, but he has, I, I just told you, he has an adamantium infused skeleton and he has regenerative healing factors. There's nothing I can do to him to slow him down. There's nothing except like I could maybe make him laugh or make him feel sorry for me. There's no chance you could make him laugh, but you might be able to make him feel sorry for you. I could just turn around and show him like my butt. <laughs> no, just, just tell him the true story about the Atlanta airport <laughs> and the hot dog and he would be disgusted to the point that he would feel so he would feel so much pity for you that he'd leave you alone and say his claws would snicked back into their hands <laughs> into his hands okay what happened to iron man to make him like that originally to iron man or wolverine sorry wolverine well okay so iron man obviously has no like superhuman abilities he's just a guy and the marvel universe there are different ways that you can become super powered most of the x-men wolverine we're born with a mu mutation and the mutation results in some kind of, usually around puberty, uh, results in some kind of ability or power or even a change to their appearance. And th that's when you go to Professor X to help you harness your power. Right. But Wolverine was born in the 19th century. So, I think he was like a young man, whereas the rest of the X-Men uh, had been under Professor X's tutelage. They've been under Professor X's what? Tutelage. Tut okay. Since they were like, you know, kids. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I saw the X-Men movie with you in the theater. Uh-huh. And that's when I knew this shit's not for me. 
Which one was that? <laughs> X-Men Apop- Apocalypse? Apocalypse is a really bad one to start with. <laughs> that was the only, that's the only X-Men movie I've ever seen. I had a great time watching it because not that it was good, but it was pretty bad and uh, I got to watch your face. I just like that the scary bad guy with his one-liners like right before, like he'd, he'd walk, you know, they have those scenes where like someone says something that's supposed to be badass and then they like walk until their whole body takes up the whole frame of the camera as a cut. Uh Uh-huh. There was like 10 of those in that movie. And then someone just turned blue all of a sudden, like that blue guy, the beast or whatever the hell. Yeah. (laughs) It's just, I mean, yeah, I don't get it. We'll talk about him and his winky later. Okay, is is the beat? What's his name? Beast. Beast. Is he in the top twenty-five? Yeah, Beast is in the top ten. Do you want to guess his place? Now, how the hell is this son of a bitch in the top ten? Oh, uh, he's not mainstream. Do you want to guess where he's at? Ten. He's nine. He is mainstream. No, he's because not. he's one of the X Men. And the yeah, X- but no one cares about the X Men other than Wolverine. Wait, what do you mean? Oh, that's the only X-Men that they care about? That's the only like X-Men that anyone could name. Any random person on the street could name. Well, regardless, Beast has shown up in 7,715 issues. But as like a background character, right? Well, he at least had that. I mean, yeah. Has has he had any comics where he's the star? Yeah, there are Beast, lots of Beast comics. Uh, Beast is a Marvel comic character who first appeared in X-Men number one in 1963. His real name is Hank McCoy. Hank McCoy has a genius level intellect. Uh Uh-huh. As all superheroes must. He is covered with blue fur. He has pointy ears, fangs, and has both monkey and cat features. Is that your words or Wikipedia's? They said simian and feline. Okay. (laughs) I said monkey and cat. Thank you. He has this animal-like physiology. Uh, with enhanced physical attributes uh, and the sharp claws and teeth. And yeah, the bullet I have under here is, what does his winky look like? Hmm. I would imagine it probably looks like when a dog is just in normal mode, when the dog is not (laughs) excited and there's just this like sort of... Like a pocket? Yeah, just this sort of thing that looks like it's ready to hold something uh, in it, like a sheath. I imagine it looks like that, just a little bump that something awful comes out of. So, this man, when he's in normal mode, does he have a normal mode or is he always no, like No, he's stuck like this now. But why? Why does everyone else get... Wolverine it's... gets to sheath his claws. Some mutants in those in the comics and movies have no control over their appearance and can look like disgusting monsters all the time. Uh, and then there's others that like, <laughs> that look like supermodels and they can fly and nothing bad ever happens to them. So, how did Beast support himself? How did he get a job? How did he go to school? He's still a scientist. He still does science with his big blue body, only sometimes he hangs upside down by his monkey feet. I don't understand. So, he's an accepted part of the community? Yeah. Oh, I told you. Remember when we talked about the end of X-Men 3, The Last Stand? I did not see it. Well, I know. That's why I described it to you. Kelsey Grammer as Beast is just cut, made up in blue fur with flowing blue locks. That blows my mind. And he's wearing a suit and giving a speech. And then the camera comes out and it turns into a, a TV screen. Wolverine is watching. Wolverine kind of nods with a smirk and says, nice job, furball. <laughs> now, who thought Kelsey fucking Grammer <laughs> was the best choice for Beast? I don't know. <laughs> I mean... I assumed it was part of his community service for having a DUI. <laughs> and why did Kelsey even think, oh, I'm going to audition to be Beast? He probably thought, you know, I'm a... I'm a beast in bed. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine Kelsey Grammer was like, you know, I'm 58 years old, overweight. I've started in two successful series that are in syndication. I have millions of dollars. I would like to sit in a chair for six hours a day and have people torture me with makeup to make me look like a blue buffoon. So, when someone has to be made up like that for six hours a day... Oh, my God. Do they have to do that every single day? Yeah. So, then they're getting up at what? Like three in the morning or something? Yeah. To get... For months, right? Or weeks at least. I-, I realize like actors have amazing sweet lives but the part about sitting there and-, and having people put makeup on you every day and then having to like hang out in that and do your job in it, that's- that is work. 
Think about the actors that are assholes, which I assume Kelsey Grammer must be. I would, I think it's probably a safe bet. <laughs> and the makeup artists have to deal with him for six hours a day. I mean, I've heard Ron Perlman, you know, can be a, a real turkey. Because you got to talk to them. Yeah. Unless they just sit there in silence for six hours. I, I bet by the second day they're like, let's just do this. I bet Ron Perlman uh, grew quickly tired of all the Hellboy shit. Well, you know, you mentioned six hours of torture. That's how I feel right now doing this show. It must have been six hours by now, right? Yeah. Beast in the top 10. Sorry, it's bullshit. Uh, well, he's there. Number nine. Okay, then fucking anyone can be on this list. Um, I'm going to guess the Joker is four or five. No, the Joker is not in the top 25. Give me a fucking break. How is that possible? Because, again, he's only one of many villains in Batman's rogues gallery. And although he has appeared in other series and even in his own comics, not nearly to the extent that these other guys have. So, okay, Beast is more popular than Joker. Okay. Yep. Are there any villains in the top 10? No. Okay. Is Lex Luthor in the top 25? He's not. It's really hard for a villain to make it up there with these because multiple good guys normally appear together because they're part of teams. They're, you're having multiple characters have an appearance in one comic book where there may just be one villain and it's one of many villains in their universe. Okay. So, why don't I get to some big hitters here? I've been kind of saving these for the end but right. I'm going to start nailing them off. So, I'm going to guess Batman is one or two. Batman is number one. Batman is number one with 14,358 issue appearances. He is DC Comics' most popular character. His first appearance, Detective Comics number 27 in 1939. So, that was only their 27th comic? Yeah, the 27th in the series. I have no idea what the first 26 issues possibly, uh, possibly com com were comprised of. I'm sure there's lots of lost superheroes that were popular back in the day that have just kind of faded. Yeah, I, I don't have, I, I'm sure there are some cool resources out there on them, but did not dig any up for this. Although that is kind of a good idea for another list. So, Batman's abilities. Genius level intellect. Peak human physical condition. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, haven't you seen him with his shirt off? Skilled martial artist and hand-to-hand -hand combatant. Expert detective. And then he also utilizes high-tech equipment and weapons. So, was he all of those things before he became Batman? Bruce Wayne. He was an expert detective and a hand-to-hand -hand combat specialist all before Batman? Sort of. So, if you go by... Yeah, Frank Miller did Batman Year One, which tells a story that's very similar to the story you see in Batman Begins. If you're using Batman Begins as your reference, it's actually pretty close to the comic origin for him. So, yeah, he went off and trained in like hand-to-hand -hand combat and martial arts. I think he had some training in like, call it spelunking, <laughs> in cliff diving, jumping, things that take like ropes and harnesses. But that's about it. I think... All of the studying that would have come along with being a detective, a scientist, had to have come as part of like his first few years because mm -hmm. it's absurd to be an Olympic class athlete and a genius and a scientist and a detective and a ninja. When he this whole time had no motivation to do any of that since his parents are like uber rich. Well, I mean, his motivation to do that is to avenge his parents' deaths. Who were they killed by? It depends on the comic or origin story, but the main one is they were killed by kind of a random thug named Joe Chill. You see, that's one thing about comics that intimidates me if I were to ever even want to get into them. It's hard to know what to take as canon and where to start. Yeah, because there's so many different origin stories, different authors, different versions of every comic hero. I think the comic industry's biggest obstacle for people who are interested and want to get into it is that it's is that there is not a good resource online to say like, okay, if you want to follow Batman here, are the issues that are currently publishing right now, if you want to follow this storyline. But no, they don't do a good job of that. And it comics is still very much one of those things where if you don't have friends who are into it, or if you don't find like a community online to help you, that your best bet is just to go down to the local comic shop and it's extremely hard to figure out. Yep. Just like you and me.
We're complicated people. Uh, Batman is the oldest one on here so far, 1939. Uh, there's one other that's older than the Batman. I'm sure you'll... Superman. Superman's number two. Superman is number two. Let's go ahead and talk about Superman. Superman is second on the list. 13,164 issues. Uh, again, he is a DC comic character. There are only two DC comic characters in the top 10 and they are in the number one and two positions. That's interesting. The next DC comic character is Dick Grayson at number 14, Wonder Woman at number 19. Uh, I forgot about Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman is 19 and that's it. There are only four DC characters in the top 25, but they also hold the number one and number two positions. Why is Marvel so much more prominent than DC? The DC comics just have a history of like bag management and poor story decisions. DC was quite a bit bigger and more popular like in the early 90s when they launched some sort of gimmicky things like the death of Superman. But no, they just make really weird decisions. Like instead of refining stories, they were like, we fucked up so bad, we should just relaunch. And even when they relaunched, they couldn't ride that wave and keep the momentum going. I'm sure that like they've, they even relaunched the continuity since they relaunched the new 52 because they had fucked up so many storylines and annoyed so many people that they just started over again. So, so when someone is writing a comic for DC or Marvel or whoever, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily up to the writer of the comic to make key decisions in the story. Is it like a board process, kind of like a movie script or something? Uh, it, it's, I'd say that in many cases, it's, it's similar to how like the Marvel uh, cinematic universe is run. In that there is an overall story that they want to tell. That DC wants to tell or Marvel. And if you come in, they might say like, okay, the idea of this story is to get to this point. Or you might pitch them an idea for a story and they say, okay, that's going to become part of the official canon and they may even have other writers help support that vision. But yeah, I think they can't just introduce a new character without clearing it first. Okay. So, tell me about Superman. Superman, first appearance, Action Comics number one, 1938. So, only a year before Batman. Uh, Batman's alter ego, of course, is Clark Kent. Now, Superman's abilities have grown and grown and grown since his first appearance in 1938 where he mainly had superhuman strength and he could jump really high. That's where the original line, uh, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, comes from. So, he has superhuman strength. You know, like it used to be in Action Comics number one, it features him lifting a car over his head on the cover, you know, to demonstrate how strong he is. But his strength has been shown uh, up to the point where he could shift the orbits of planets uh, or crush coal into diamond in his hands. He is invulnerable, power of flight, including faster than light flight, X-ray vision, heat <laughs> vision, X-ray vision, super hearing. And the ability to blow freezing air, too. So, he can do literally anything. How do you defeat Superman? Kryptonite? Kryptonite. Either kryptonite or hitting, like, the few vulnerable spots he has in that, like, he is very intelligent. He's an award-winning reporter and a detective in his own right. But he's not a super genius like Lex Luthor. He's not even as smart uh, as Batman. Everyone that he loves is human and is completely vulnerable. Lex Luthor usually defeats him by like leveraging one of those weaknesses, either someone he loves or kryptonite and some kind of complicated strategy around that. What do you do with the kryptonite? You just hold it up to him and say, look, just... and he goes, ah, my <laughs> eyes, and then he dies. If he is in close proximity to it, he gets sick. If he is injected with uh, something that contains kryptonite or... Does he die? I don't know that you can kill him with kryptonite but uh again in the comics you can weaken him to the point with kryptonite that he looks like a shriveled disgusting body but as soon as you stick him in sunlight he <laughs> powers right back up i saw man of steel yeah and there's this there's a scene the last hours is a huge fight scene in like the city mm -hmm. and my question is if this man is invulnerable yeah. and can't be hurt then what's the point of even fighting him for an hour yeah, I know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. I don't have good answers for you. Superman is a really hard character for me to like or get into because because of that. I mean, there are some stories with him that are really cool. Uh, Superman Birthright is a great graphic novel 
uh, about the origin of Superman. And Superman Kingdom Come is another cool Superman story. And in Kingdom Come... Kingdom what? Kingdom Come. Kingdom what? C-O-M-E. Say it by itself. No. So, (laughs) in Kingdom Come, they show what happens like, you know, Superman is essentially immortal. Yeah. Under Earth's yellow sun. So, he will live uh, until the Earth uh, becomes a red giant, at which time he will lose his powers and, and finally be killed. It, that he could potentially live until the sun goes like supernova. So, yeah, a little powerful. Yeah, too powerful for me. Yeah, it's just hard to get into someone who he has very specific vulnerabilities and I don't know. I haven't read a lot of Superman, so I could be way off on this and someone could pop up and school me on Superman. That'd be fine. So, I have another guess. Before we take another guess, we're going to take a detour and talk about our latest Apple Podcast reviews. Yeah, let's do some reviews. We had our first negative review. Uh Uh-oh. And we're going to read it on this show. Hit me with it. I'm ready. Okay. And uh, by the way, if you want your review written, no matter what it says, just write a review on iTunes and we'll read it on the show. But this one comes from L. Hick and they said, quote, this podcast is great if you're a masochist. The amount of narcissism and smarm (laughs) <laughs> exhibited by the more tolerable host is enough to choke down with salt and lime. The holier-than-thou attitude dripping from the pores of the other host caused me on several occasions to end an episode early, end quote. I have a lot to say about this. Okay. Number one, which host is who? Who is the more tolerable and who is the holier-than-thou? Which one do you think you are? I don't know. So, the more, the more tolerable host has narcissism and smarm. Smarm is ingratiating behavior, be, to behave in an ingratiating way in order to gain favor, or to smooth down one's hair with water, oil, or gel. That must be what they're talking about. Yeah. And the other host is holier than thou. Holier than... What does holier than thou mean? It means you think you're better or... Well, why don't you just read it to us? Characterized by an attitude of moral superiority, sanctimonious, <laughs> yeah. self-righteous, complaintant, smug, self-satisfied, priggish, pious. Well, I don't know. I don't claim any moral high ground. I think also to be holier than that, you have to have like some amount of, you have to have like high self-esteem. I would just say I have no self-esteem, not low self-esteem, just none. So, maybe I don't, I don't think that one is me. I'll take either one. I don't give a shit. They also said that the holier than their attitude dripping from the pores of the other host caused me on several occasions to end an episode early. Now, my qualm here is that clearly they've listened <laughs> just to- keep listening. Yeah. So, if you don't like the show, just stop listening. El Hick, I don't get you, but uh, thanks for giving us a try anyway. If you do have constructive criticism to give me and Brandon, we are always willing to hear that, but just email it to us at tennispod at gmail.com. So, why don't we cleanse our palate with a- Nice review. Yeah, let's hear a good one. This one comes from Joey Peretti, who says, he gave us five stars and says, fun and funny pop culture cast that is way worth your time. Oh, thanks. I, I don't know. Are we pop culture though? Because so much of the stuff we talk about is old. Well, comic books. Well, are... but baby names in the 1800s are not pop culture. Well, they're going to be. The pop, it means popular and that's where we come in. Regardless, thank you, Joey. Thank you to everyone who reviews us on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts. So, I will uh, indulge you now with another guess on your, on your holier-than-thou self-entitled uh, top 10 list here. Indulge me. Uh, I'm, Spider-Man's number four. Uh, exactly right. Very impressive. It hurts physically <laughs> to compliment you in that way. Well, and I know that your narcissistic attitude doesn't allow you <laughs> it's to... It's very uh, difficult. To uh, admit that, yeah. Spider-Man's number four with 12,164 issue appearances. He is a Marvel comic character. His first appearance was in Amazing Fantasy number 15 in 1962. Was that, a, was that published by Playboy? Amazing Fantasy. Amazing Spider-Man, Amazing Fantasy. Spider-Man, true identity is Peter Parker. Uh, Spider-Man, his abilities, genius-level intellect, proficient scientist and inventor, 
So, Spider-Man wasn't born uh, Spider-Man. You know that, right? Right. He was bit by a radioactive spider. Right. Instead of being a mutant human, he is a human mutate. So, he's originally human who mutated uh, for later reasons. Like the Hulk is also a human mutate. So, how does the spider know to bite the kid with genius level intellect that would just uh, help him also become a superhero? You're asking this question of comic books where there's also a blue man that hangs upside down and is a scientist played by Kelsey Graham. With a dog weenie. With a, with a dog weenie. He has superhuman strength, speed, <laughs> durability, agility, stamina, reflexes, coordination, balance, and endurance. He has some aspects of spider physiology. He has a precognitive spidey sense. Uh -huh. He can cling to most surfaces. And in some versions, the webbing ability comes out of his hands. In some versions, it comes out of Weenie? wrist shooters that he invented. Weenie? Right. And then other versions, he shoots it like a spider out of his ass. Does he really? Yeah. There's a version where when he gets from building to building, he pulls his pants down in the back and he, just like a spider, shoots a spinneret of web. You're fucking kidding. Yeah. <laughs> okay. He just backs up to the edge of the building and he hangs his <laughs> ass over and then like it just very slowly craps out. <laughs> it doesn't even shoot. Do you no, remember? That's, that's how a spider does it. Is it slow though? I guess it is. <laughs> yeah, a spider just slowly craps this thing out and then they use their back legs to help pull it along. Does the web literally come out of the ass of the spider or is there a different hole? I assume that on a spider that hole is for everything. <laughs> You it's for know. it's for eating, fucking spinning webs, all of it. Remember, we had a conversation one time about if humans could spin webs. Yeah. If it just slowly came out and then you had to use your legs in like a diamond shape to bring it about. Oh, my God. What a mess. <laughs> what a mess. Why didn't he get any of the other physiological parts of the spider? Because like, it's a comic book. You know, in the movie, he wakes up the next morning and instead of having like a you know, a thin teenager's body has a muscular, athletic Spider-Man body and he doesn't need his glasses anymore. His vision's perfect. And then he can stick to shit. Why didn't he wake up and he was like, holy fuck, I got a hundred eyes. Can you imagine if you didn't have to do anything except get bit by a spider and you wake up and you're fucking buff as hell? <sighs> I'd be getting my ass bit by spiders <laughs> on purpose all the time. <laughs> I get stung by wasps in the backyard all the time and I haven't, I still look like shit. Yeah. I also found it interesting that he gets bit by a spider and becomes more spider-like and part of that is superhuman durability. But spiders are not strong or durable. They get squished all the time. They are squishy. Are they strong and durable relative to other, I guess, well, they're not an insect, but relative to insects? Hmm. Because they have an exoskeleton. I don't know if that's good or bad. But if you crack an exoskeleton on the inside, it's just goo. Do they have like a little brain and a little heart? Yeah. They don't have a heart. I think they do. But they don't need blood. Do they have blood? Yeah. You don't fucking know. You're just saying things. How do they have blood? <laughs> they don't need... Let's look it up. Do spiders... Someone said, <laughs> asked, do spiders molt? Do spiders poop? Do spiders sleep? Do spiders have bones? Do they hibernate? Do they drink water? Do they have ears? <laughs> Do spiders have ears? Do they have brains? Spiders, t oh my god. Why I'm would wrong. someone ask if they have brains as if they have multiple brains? Spiders technically do not have brains. See? Spider-Man should have lost his fucking brain. So that, oh, they don't have like exactly brains. They have like these, their brain and their nervous system are not quite as like separate as ours appears to be. You know, if you look at a cross section of us, you have the brain and then you can see all the branches of nerves coming out. I'm looking at a cross section and their shit is fucked up inside. So, which nerve ending or whatever makes them be little assholes that hide in my shoes and bite the shit out of me for no reason? And they don't move for like three days until you get close to them and then they're just <laughs> fucking lightning fast. Ha! <laughs> Yeah. They're like you can there can be a, a spider in the corner of the garage for 3 <laughs> days and then when I finally go like all right buddy time to get out of here and go to scoot on him it's like he has been at the starting block <laughs> for the 50 yard dash that whole time. Yeah, uh, in our phobia episode we had a debate about spiders and you said that you don't squish them you let them live and walk around. I didn't say I said time to go like I'll scoot them away. No, but you see 
his ass is dead. Since that episode, I have killed one spider, but I have taken two outside. I can't believe if any one of you takes spiders and puts them outside instead of squishing them, just unsubscribe from our show. Well, it's not like I put them down gently and like pack them a sandwich and tell them to hit the road. I usually fling them out the door and hope a bird gets them. But then what, if you want a bird to get them anyway, then why not just kill them yourself? Save I'm the- putting them back into the ecosystem <laughs> instead of in my garage or bathroom. If you squish it and just put the squished body parts outside, it will also be part of the ecosystem. Mm-mm. Birds turn their nose up at that. <laughs> but there's bugs that will eat them. What's number five on this list? I think I've hit all the like the main super obvious hitters. I'm, let's think if I'm missing anyone. We got, uh, let me think of the movies here. Who am I missing? Oh, Thor. Thor is number 11. Hmm. The first Thor movie didn't really impress me that much. And I wasn't impressed with Thor as a character really hardly at all until Thor Ragnarok. Gave Thor like a sense of humor and kind of set a tone that was closer to like Guardians of the Galaxy. Since then, Thor has become a much more interesting character. And my favorite version of Thor was in Avengers Endgame. Okay, uh, so Thor is 11. Yep. Is there any more X-Men characters in the top 10? There are, so the remaining characters are uh, Marvel characters, which all X-Men characters are Marvel characters. Professor X. Professor X is number 16. Let me tell you, there is one Avenger, there are two X-Men, and one Fantastic. Oh, Fantastic. The, The Rock Guy from Fantastic Four. The Rock Guy from Fantastic Four is, he's number 10. What's his name? Uh, his name is Thing. Oh, The Thing. thing. Yeah, The Thing. Uh, the Thing is number 10. Uh, he's appeared in 6,492 issues of Marvel Comics. His first appearance was in Fantastic Four number one. He was in the 60s. Uh, his real name is Ben Grimm and his job before he was a Thing and a member of the Fantastic Four was he was an astronaut and a pilot. <laughs> are there any Doi Doi superheroes or are they all like this? Well, I think Wolverine is technically like not academically smart. I'm sure he's smart when it comes to fighting. Okay. The Thing, if you don't know, he is a giant guy made out of orange rock. Right. Uh, His abilities. He's a skilled street fighter and a hand-to-hand combatant. Hmm. He has superhuman strength, stamina, and durability. Who doesn't? Rock-like skin. Who doesn't? Excellent dexterity. Who doesn't? Does that one not make you What is dexterity? Is that like you can use both hands? <laughs> yeah, you can just <laughs> use his hands. It's like they're... It's like, well, look, even though he's got rocks for hands, look how good he's doing. Yeah. So, he has excellent dexterity. I like this. Not superhuman. Above average reflexes. <laughs> and enhanced lung capacity. He can hold his breath for a long time. So, he's also like David Blaine. You know this guy's pleasuring himself sometimes. Well, look... Well, uh, we'll get to that. What do you think his weenie's like? Uh, that's my other note on here. What does his winky look like? And we have some clues to this. Looking forward to hearing him. In the 1995 film Mallrats, Jason Lee's character Brody meets Stan Lee at the Eden Prairie Mall and has a chance to ask him about his favorite superheroes. Most of the questions involve their genitals and he asks him, what about the thing? Is his dork made of orange rock like the rest of his body? And Stan Lee ignores the question, which makes me think it's true. There's no reason for it not to be. The only part of him on his body that is not made of orange rock are his eyeballs, and that's soft tissue. So, if, if it's hard rock already... Oh, the eyes are an organ. Okay, but the penis is an organ. The winky is an organ. Mm. If you play it the right way. Let's go with the theory that, <laughs> that the weenie is orange rock like the rest of him. Uh-huh. Then when he's excited, Mm -hmm. does it just become a harder orange, (laughs) oranger rock or? Uh, I'm as hard as a rock. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe it's a pocket situation, kind of like the beast with his weenie. Where it emerges? It's retracted and it (laughs) it emerges at the critical time. Well, if we could get a good look at Korg's weenie, he is also made out of rock. Who's Korg? Korg was a character in Thor Ragnarok, also living with Thor in Avengers Endgame. He's made out of rocks, just like Thing, uh, only he's gray. So, I bet you could get him to show you his winky before 
Thing? Uh-huh. Thing has more of a temper, right? No, yeah, I think Thing is more uptight. And I think Korg, if you just asked him really nice, who knows anything about his culture? It might be totally normal. Think about all the implications of having a rock body. What about your organs inside, your stomach, your lungs? Well, like I said... Your intestines. Korg's eyes and Thing's eyes appear to be regular organic tissue. So, maybe your organs are still organic tissue. And it does say rock-like skin, not rock-like whole body. Doesn't it make more sense for humans to have rock bodies instead of skeletons? Because then your organs are more protected. Well, that's an exoskeleton. And we just covered how you can easily crunch and squish a bug. But you can't easily crunch and squish rocks. Korg's lungs and spleen and liver and bladder are all extra protected from his rock body. I don't even know if Korg has those things because he's an alien. I don't know what's in the inside Okay, of but him. the thing has all those things. Well, he was a human, so I'm assuming... Yeah, but think about one bad thing about the rock body. No, no, not a lot of booty to squeeze. There's no squishiness. Mm-mm. So, you just got to deal with a rock hard. He can only make his ass like clunk. <laughs> Can't clap. It can only kind of... <laughs> Thunk. <laughs> well, we don't even know if there's cheeks. Like this is uh, the thing twerking. <laughs> uh, Stan Lee, what a pervert. I didn't know I was going to become a Foley artist on this podcast today. So, if you're settling in for an evening of listening to this podcast, it's clear you're a fan of mystery, mayhem, and the dark side of humanity. I'm Dr. Shiloh, a former cop. And I'm Dr. Scott, a former Hollywood entertainment professional. We're now both forensic psychologists working in Southern California. Are you fascinated by the internal processes of criminals? Do you wonder, how could they do that? In each episode of our podcast, LA Not So Confidential, we dissect the nexus where true crime, forensic psychology, and entertainment meet. We'll serve up fascinating cases viewed through the lens of human behavior, delivered with our signature gallows humor. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play at LA Not So Confidential for download and subscription. You can also follow us on Instagram at LA Not So Podcast and Twitter at LA Not So Pod. Come and join us for LA Not So Confidential. Okay, so you've got, I think, three left. Yeah, okay. Number number five, number six, and number eight. Are there any females? There is. There's one female. Captain Marvel. No, it's not Captain Marvel. And it's not Wonder Woman. Batwoman? Batgirl? No, it's a Marvel character. It's an X, it's an X, it's an X-woman. The, the one that's blue, too, uh, that, uh, what's her name, Jennifer Lawrence plays in the n- new ones. No, it's not Mystique. Okay, I'm not going to guess this one. It's an X-Men. Let me start reading you her abilities. Was she played by Kelsey Grammer as well? (laughs) Yeah. Expert tactician and thief. Psionic ability to manipulate weather patterns over vast area. I vaguely remember this in X-Men Apocalypse. She was played by Halle Berry. Her name is Storm. Okay. Storm. Jesus. You never hear about Storm by herself. Storm, uh, rarely, but because she's an X-Men an X-Man or a member of the X-Men, she has lots of appearances. And she is actually a really big leader in the X-Men universe. She just hasn't really been popular in the movies. And anyway, Storm has appeared in 7,777 issues of Marvel Comics, starting with giant size X-Men number one in 1975. What, What number is Storm? What number? Oh, on the list, she's number eight. Just behind Iron Man. Uh, her name is... I'm going to butcher this. Aurora Monroe. O-R-O-R-O. She's from the continent of Africa. I don't know what country. But like I was saying earlier, she controls the weather. She can control atmospheric pressure if you're trying to watch your barometer. She can do temperature modification. She has ecological empathy, which I, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, and the last thing on here is flight. Okay. All right. So, I need six and five. Yeah, you're missing six and five. So, you're missing an X-Man and an Avenger. Was the Avenger in the endgame? Yes. Who am I missing? 
Oh, Captain America. Of course. Captain America is number five on the list with 9,139 yeah. issue appearances. I don't know how I missed him. Of course, he is a Marvel character. His first appearance in Captain America Comics number one. Now, I had incorrectly remembered that Captain America was created after as a reaction to the US joining World War II. This is not the case. Steve Rogers was administered super soldier serum in March of 1941. That is seven months. Yeah. I'm sorry, nine months before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. He was punching Hitler out the year before Pearl Harbor. He wasn't tolerating Nazi shit from day one. He was created by writers who knew that the US getting into World War II was inevitable and they hated the Nazis and they wanted to create a character who beat the shit out of Nazis and I think that's awesome. So yeah, he Captain America was already beating the shit out of Hitler before America officially joined World War II. One could say that Captain America led us to victory in World War II, although that would probably be wrong. Hmm. So, Steve Rogers was given super soldier serum. It granted him peak human strength, speed, durability, agility, reflexes, senses, and mental processing. He is a master martial artist and hand-to-hand -hand combatant. He has an accelerated healing factor. He's a max master tactician, strategist, and field commander. And he wields a vibranium shield. And in the Marvel Universe, vibranium is like a, this very extremely rare, unbreakable metal. I found out uh, during my research that in the comics, Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave Captain America that shield in the Oval Office. There's an image of FDR sitting in his wheelchair with a blanket over his lap, <laughs> looking all sickly, and he's just giving Captain America his shield. Well, yeah. Who else would give it to him? Yeah. So, Captain America is uh, number five. I know my number six guess. Okay. Uh, but before, I, I want to ask about the Watchmen. Are they in the top 25? There are no uh, Watchmen. There really aren't a lot of comics featuring the Watchmen outside of the original graphic novel and maybe some like short run spinoff series. Uh, but as popular as that graphic novel is, no. Alan Moore is very protective with his property rights. That's why I'm really surprised that HBO is getting a shot to uh, make a Watchmen series. It makes me think that Alan Moore probably didn't have any say over that. So, Watchmen's really popular, but it's been minimal in terms of... Because the writer, the Alan Moore, the guy who holds the, you know, I think the intellectual property, I think, holds the rights to it. Yeah, is very like anti-commercial and... He's like a, you know, in vein of David Lynch, like a true artist to the point where, you know, he's probably lost out on millions and millions of dollars because he has uh, some principles. Six is Magneto. No, there's no bad guys on here, but Magneto would have been a good guess. Well, then I don't, that's the only other X-Men. Number have. six is the, the leader of the X-Men team. Not Professor X, but if there's one guy who's like, I'm the... I'm just under Professor X and leading the X-Men. It would be this guy. I don't know. David Bowie. His real name is Scott Summers. Does that help? SpongeBob. Well, let me just give you his abilities and see if that helps you. He only has two on here. Optic Force Blasts and he's a master tactician. Optic Force Blasts. Oh, it's the guy that can shoot lasers out of his eyes. Yeah, his name's Cyclops. Okay. Uh, Cyclops is number six on the most popular comic heroes. Uh, 8,967 issue appearances for Cyclops in Marvel Comics. His first appearance was X-Men number one in 1963. Uh, same issue as Beast. Like I mentioned before, his real name is Scott Summers. He can shoot optic force blasts from his eyes. But Cyclops, reading about Cyclops and his abilities or his to me, it was his lack of abilities that stands out because almost every superhero is like super powered and has super strength and super durability. What about Cyclops who has like, he is athletic. He has a very, every one of these guys, he has a strong muscular body. But let's just say at most, he's as fit as like The Rock, right? No one's as fit as The Rock, but I'll get your point. So, right, we're being very generous here and saying that Cyclops is as tall and built as The Rock. Listener of the show. 
Right. But if the rock got picked up and thrown by Juggernaut or another large, strong, super-powered mutant, he would die. So, I feel sorry for all of the X-Men or the other superheroes that have to fight or even lead a team alongside all these super strong and super durable heroes or guys who are made out of rock. Uh, but they just like, if they got hit in the head with a bullet, they'd be dead. Well, think about his inferior, inferi- <laughs> inferiority complex with all these other superheroes around him that are so much better than him. You know, their Cyclops is part of a uh, love triangle. Whoa. Because Cyclops' uh, girlfriend, and I think later his wife, is fellow X-Men Jean Grey. Is she the blue one? No, that's Mystique. Jean Grey is going to be played by uh, the actress who plays Sansa in the new movie. Oh, yeah. She was in Apocalypse. I remember seeing her. Oh, as, yeah, right, as uh, Jean Grey. So, she stars in uh, the new X-Men movie called Dark Phoenix. And uh, Jean Grey and Scott Summers are boyfriend-girlfriend and then later married. But Jean Grey and Wolverine share a mutual attraction, but a relationship that is teased but can never start. And Cyclops has to be intimidated by Wolverine because like anything you do to him, he's just going to get up later and kick your ass. Yeah. Like the most, the most you could do is blast him with your eye blasts and in a little while he would get up and murder you because you just have a regular soft human body like Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever referred to as a soft body, <laughs> but uh, I, I take your point. You guys heard it here first. Cyclops is, uh, I mean, if you're going to be a superhero, be a superhero. He seems weak on the superhero totem pole. Cyclops' entire ability and his entire like life is built around just one of Superman's throwaway abilities. Yeah, another way to look at it is any other superhero in the top 10 can kick Cyclops' ass easily. Yeah. Maybe Spider-Man would be his best chance. If Cyclops was standing like 15 feet away looking in the other direction and you threw a big rock at his head, you could kill him easy. You know, the thing about Storm, I'm not, like not to jump, but because I'm thinking about all the soup, the powers of these heroes. Yeah, she doesn't have super durability or super strength either. And her abilities all relate to the weather, right? Which it's really hard to like put up oh, a shield. If someone's running at you, if Wolverine or Sabretooth, Sabretooth's a bad guy. So, let's say Sabretooth is running at her from 20 feet away. What can she do with the weather in that, in those like two seconds to stop a raging super powered primal beast? She just blow at him real hard? That's what I would do. I'd blow his ass away. But another thing is even if she did summon a tornado or something to like separate them. Mm-hmm. That's still going to affect all these civilians around yeah. you, right? Yeah, I'm glad you could save yourself by destroying a city block. <laughs> since, and the only reason that that bad guy showed up is because you showed up too. It's true. I think these superheroes are the real holier-than-thou narcissistic podcast hosts and sidekick hosts. It is pretty narcissistic to be like, I'm a superhero. <laughs> when bad shit happens, there's only one person who can show up and cut that shit out and it's me. I'm looking here. The oldest hero in the top 10 is Captain America, 1941. Was Super- oh, no, it's Superman, 1938. Oh, you're right, 1938. Was the concept of a superhero even a thing before the 1900s? Oh, like in the 1800s? I don't know. Yeah. They, I think they probably wouldn't use the word superhero, but I think Paul Bunyan and Pecos Bill, <laughs> you know, those like tall tail guys, John Henry. Yeah. I think they are probably the 19th century version of superheroes. I think like most generations or most cultures have like legends based on virtue. Yeah. I guess you could even say some of the heroes of like the Troy battle in uh, the Odyssey. Yeah. They're, they're based on virtues and those characters are used to tell morality tales or... And I think, yeah, I think they just had different versions of superheroes. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay. So, we did it. Why don't you go back through... Why don't you go through the 25 so we can hear some of the ones we haven't heard? Top 25 most popular comic book characters by number of issue appearances. I'll get to the numbers when I get hit 10. So, from 25 counting down, it's Kitty Pride. Never heard of it. Uh, Kitty Pride is from X-Men. Invisible Woman. She's uh, Fantastic Four. Rogue. X-Men. Nightcrawler. X-Men. 
uh, Human Torch, Fantastic Four, Mr. Fantastic, Fantastic Four, Wonder Woman, DC, Archangel, Marvel, Jean Grey, Marvel, Professor X, Marvel, Colossus, Marvel, Dick Grayson, also known as the first Robin, and now Nightwing from DC Comics, Hulk, Iceman, and then Thor is number 11. The top 10 are The Thing from Marvel Comics, Beast from Marvel Comics, 8 was Storm, 7 was Iron Man, 6 is Cyclops, 5 was Captain America, number 4 is Spider-Man, number 3 Wolverine, the most popular Marvel character in terms of comic appearances, Wolverine with 12,912, number 2 Superman, and number 1 Batman, 14,358 issue appearances. I can't believe there's even been that many comics in the world, period. Much less just comics that feature Batman. It's nuts. Think about a, multiple comics, like, I don't know, 30, 40 different series of comic, comics coming out every week, every year. And in some cases, since the late 30s, early 40s, but definitely picking up in the early 60s, which would make it like nearly 60 years worth of tons and tons of comics. Stan Lee came around in the 60s, right? Yeah, Stan Lee. Marvel kind of hit the, um, I think what's it called? The Silver Age. Uh, the Silver Age of comics, I think, was like the early 60s. And that's when Stan Lee created all those Avengers characters, Spider-Man. Like, Stan Lee gets a lot of credit for creating those characters as he should. He was like the voice or the face of Marvel for a long time. But there are a lot of other writers that he would be the first, or if he was alive, uh, would be quick to tell you that they had a huge hand in creating them, other writers and artists. Uh, but yeah, Stan Lee is, has always been the face of Marvel and, like I said, rightly credited with being a big part of creating all of this. Just as um, I am rightly credited with creating the Tennis Podcast. Two life achievements completely on par with each other. Yeah, well, that was uh, fun. I, that was edu... Edutainment. Edutainment education for me. I, yeah, I didn't know most of that. And when you were going through 25 through 11, I had not heard of like half of those. Yeah, maybe we should do a bonus, epi bonus episode where I tell you a little bit about each of these characters that you will never, ever care about. Maybe we shouldn't. It kind of makes it clear how dominant the top 10 to 15 are in like the lore of comic books. And, you know, we've talked about this before too. It's uh, interesting how the nerd culture <laughs> uh -huh. is like so mainstream now. You know what I mean? Like this stuff was not openly talked about in mainstream culture as it is now. And it's just uh, kind of interesting how things have changed. No, uh, I guess you can think. I, I credit the first Spider-Man movie more than anything, like I said. I think that opened the door. No, you are, you are right. It's weird that the Sony movie series, which... You know, Sony has really shit the bed on Spider-Man in recent years. That's why they loaned him out to Marvel to finally like do something right with him. Uh, Sony owns the rights to Spider-Man. Uh, so, when you see Spider-Man show up in the Marvel universe, it's because he's like on loan or in partnership with Sony who can't manage their superhero way out of a fucking bag. It's interesting that they got at least the first two Spider-Man movies in the early 2000s right. Yeah, I guess my point is like whether or not you love or hate those Tobey Maguire films, I feel like those were the first. I don't remember really hearing about superhero stuff before that, prior, any, aside from the 90s cartoons. The last superhero movies that I can think of that were like a big deal before that were the, the last like Batman movies that were just awful turds. Yeah, but even with those Batman movies, they seem so disconnected from the comics in terms of like you never heard anyone talk about comics. Oh my God. Yeah, I was actually thinking about the series of Batman movies that started with the 1989 Tim Burton Batman movie yeah. and then ended with the Joel Schumacher uh, one with, uh, what was that, Batman and Robin with Arnold as the Iceman and Poison Ivy. The, first, the one in 1989, it was directed by Tim Burton. Again, a guy that I never would have associated with the Batman that had emerged at the end of the 80s was a return to this dark, gritty character and away from the campiness of the 60s. I love the campiness of the 60s and I love the grittiness of the 80s. And the 1989 Batman actually does a really fun job of combining dark, gritty realism with campiness. It, it truly like kind of straddles that line. And for that reason, I think it's a super fun movie and it's probably my favorite all around Batman movie. Batman Returns was a little bit like that, but it seemed to be a little bit more up its own ass than uh, the first one. And then they just got really bad. And I think people 
went back to the idea that superhero movies are fucking goofy. And after that last Batman movie, they're like, how are you going to make another Batman or make a superhero movie that we aren't laughing at, you know, the moment we hear about it. Right. And Spider-Man turned that shit around, made it, I wouldn't say adult, but it made it realistic. It made it like a good movie, made it something that was fun to follow. There's definitely a lot of shit you can pick apart from those Spider-Man movies in retrospect. But yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think that's what made people think, uh, yeah, I can go see a superhero movie and not feel embarrassed about it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Well, anyway, do you have anything else you want to say about superheroes before I transition us? I think I've said all that could possibly be said. I think you've said more than enough. Um, my superpower is telling our listeners how to follow us on social media. Boom, bang, bam! You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at TennisPod10 ISHPOD. If you can't get enough of us, I encourage you to visit TennisPod.com. Find our past episodes, buy some merch, get to know your host and sidekick host. That's TennisPod.com. If you have suggestions for future lists, you can hit us up on any of those social media accounts. You can also email us at TennisPod at gmail.com. And we will be back next week with episode 39 as we march toward episode 50. And I have a big idea for episode 50, Mr. Sidekick host. Is it the big idea that I'm going to be granted equal co-host status? Absolutely not. It's, uh, we're going to do an episode about the top 10 Maury moments. <laughs> Did you see I found the, the gifts for... Yeah, I thought, I, I swear in another part of that show, she claps when she says... I thought the same thing. Wash your ass! <laughs> but I couldn't find it. Yeah, wash your ass. That goes for you, our listeners. Wash your ass between now and the next episode. Once is probably enough. Maybe twice. But yeah, we'll be back with a new top 10 list next week. And I want to thank you for listening hope you subscribe and listen to future episodes. I hope you wash your asses. I could take or leave the ass washing. Goodbye. Bye. like to thank Kevin McLeod for his song Hackbeat, which we found on Incompetech.com for the official Tennis Podcast theme. <laughs>